What are some real things that you're most fearful of? What are some real things that you're most fearful of? And I say real because some people say they're afraid of ghosts or monsters or aliens, but we know as Christians that they don't exist because God didn't create those things. So real things that you're afraid of, okay? And we're going to learn about fear today. And it's important to know what you're afraid of, what you fear, because what you fear affects the way that you live. For example, some people are afraid of animals. And I met someone who's really afraid of animals. And therefore, that person cannot go to many places because there are animals everywhere, right? There are dogs, birds. So it prevents that person from going to a lot of places. And some people are afraid of social interactions with others and therefore they'll avoid places, jobs, and events with a lot of social interactions, right? And some people have fears that are so big that when triggered, they just can't do anything. Okay? They, they just can't do anything. They become frozen because of a panic attack. But there are also healthy fears, like if you fear fire, that's a good thing because it will prevent you from touching fire or from doing things that will start fires. So as a Christian, your fears will affect how you live and worship God. And today we're going to study about a very fearsome, a fearsome, scary situation that the disciples get caught in. And we're going to see how the disciples react to that fearsome situation and what did Jesus do in that situation and what is most fearsome of all. So it's important to study this because... We'll learn how to rightly respond to all our earthly negative fears. And second, we need to know and we need to learn what we need to rightly fear so that God is glorified in our lives. So with that, why don't we all stand together? And we're going to read Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And I'll read the odd verses if you can help me read the even verses. Verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep in the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He and said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? Then even the wind and the sea obey him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us here to worship you today. I pray that your word will penetrate our hearts. It will change our hearts and our minds. It will lead us to have faith in Christ, trust in Him, and help us to all walk by faith and be further sanctified and fear what we should fear and not fear what we should not fear. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So just as a summary, Mark is the good news about Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And we've learned that he began his ministry baptized, being baptized so that he can identify himself with sinners and he went into the wilderness and gain victory over the devil by withstanding and not falling into any of the temptations Satan gave him. And then he performed miracles to show that he is the prophesied Messiah and his priority is to preach. And he preached that he is the forgiver of sins, that he is the Lord of Sabbath and he claimed to be God himself. And last week we learned that people will receive his preaching very differently though. There's four types of people, four types of soils, and only one type of people will hear and have faith in him. And now we're going to see Jesus take his disciples in a very fearsome situation where their faith will be tested. Their faith will be developed at the same time. So let's, let's look at verse 5. It says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. So we first hear that, <coughs> we see here that there's a great fearsome situation. And in verse 35, we see that it's been one day. So since Mark chapter 3, verse 20, this has all been just one long day. If you guys didn't know, all the sermons that we've heard for the last month, it's just been one day of Jesus' ministry, okay? <coughs> 
from when Jesus went back to Peter's house and many people were gathered to the point where he couldn't eat, to when the religious leaders accused him of being empowered by Satan, to Jesus preaching to the greatest crowd about the four soils, and then Jesus explaining about what the soils mean, plus explaining about God's kingdom. It's all been one day, one long day of ministry. And now Jesus tells his disciples, let us go to the other side, which means the other side of the lake of Galilee. Okay, it's a big lake. So scholars say that they were going to the west side, to the east side, which is important to know because the west side is the more populated side, while the east side is very not populated. So Jesus wanted to basically retreat. And because he's been so tired, just ministering to people, preaching to people all day, nonstop, that he needed to rest. And so, verse 36, And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So the disciples, meaning the twelve disciples, did as Jesus commanded. He wanted to go to the other side, and they obeyed Jesus, and took him into the boat, and they started crossing to the east side of the lake. And there were other boats that followed him, meaning there were actually many other boats. So I think all of us are, many of us are familiar with this story, and we only see Jesus' boat usually, but there's actually other boats with Jesus, okay? So keep that in mind for this whole entire narrative. Now what's interesting about the Sea of Galilee, it's, it's geography. So just a small geography lesson here is that the Lake of Galilee called the Sea of Galilee, it's called a sea because it's so big, it's like a sea. It's 13 miles long and seven miles wide. Compton itself is only about six miles wide and long each way. So the Lake of Galilee, it's at least twice as big as Compton. So it's big, okay? And it is about 700 feet below sea level, making it the lowest lake on the earth. So it's the lowest lake that there is. And so it's below sea level. And surrounding the lake are steep hills and mountains with many valleys and gaps, okay? And therefore the gaps between these mountains, what it does is it causes a lot of wind to come into this lake, causing storms very frequently. So storms happen in the Lake of Galilee often. Now, what's interesting is that fishing is a major industry in this lake, and all the fishing is done at night. Most of it is done at night. The reason why is because the storms happen during the day. Now, with all this in mind, keep in mind that four of Jesus' disciples, core 12 disciples, are lifelong fishermen, right? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They're fishermen. So they grew up near this lake, and they knew the weather patterns really well, and so, and during this time, it was nighttime. So they probably saw that since it's nighttime and the weather conditions are safe, it's safe to sail. So they thought it would be safe for Jesus and them to go, but then something really unexpected happened. What happens? And in verse 37, we see that a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boats so that the boat was already filling. So a storm, not just a regular storm, but a great one. So there's a key word, great, and we'll see this word great repeat itself, okay? A great storm arose. And the storm was so big, that big waves started pouring into this boat. So something to know about this boat, it is not just a very tiny boat. It's not like a 10-foot boat that all the 12 disciples were just squished into. This boat is about 26 feet long. So 26 feet is pretty long. It's like from this wall to maybe that room over there, if not longer. It's, it's pretty big, okay? It's more than enough room for 12 people to be in, 13 people to be in, and it's seven feet wide, which is pretty wide, and four feet high. So, if, so this is a not small boat, so if waves were breaking into it, that means the waves are higher than four feet, and it, it was just a very big storm. So just imagine the situation that Jesus and the disciples were in. They're in the middle of a sea, basically. There's, it's dark, it's nighttime, it's evening time. There's a huge storm. The boat is being rocked back and forth. The water is filling into the boat. So the feeling is that this boat is probably going to sink or overturn. It's very possible. And experts say this. If a boat was to overturn in the Sea of Galilee during a storm in the darkness of night, Death is certain, and the fishermen knew this, okay? If it flips over, they're in the middle of the sea, dark sea, they're going to die. 
This is a situation that will make anybody scared. So what was Jesus doing during this time then? During this fearsome time, what was Jesus doing? Let's see on verse, in verse 38. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So Jesus was so tired that he was sleeping through this entire storm. And this really shows something about Jesus. Okay? It shows that Jesus had great love, humility, and devotion to his ministry. He was preaching and ministering throughout the day for so long that he was so tired that even though there was a storm going on, he was still sleeping because he was that tired. And shows that he gave 100% of himself when he served people and when he was saving people. So what a savior we have, just a key observation. And because Jesus didn't wake up, the, the disciples woke him up and they rebuked him. Jesus was rebuked by his disciples. They said, do you not care that we're going down to destruction, Jesus? So grammatical scholars or linguistic scholars agree that this sentence, do you not care that we're going down to destruction, is a negative, is a very negative sentence, okay? It had a bitter tone to it. So basically, they were accusing Jesus of something, okay? So they were so scared that they acted unlike themselves, and they were basically rebuking their own master. They accused Jesus, and they were basically saying this. They were complaining that Jesus allowed the situation to happen, and they criticized him for not being responsible to help them during this whole storm, and they were angry and bitter towards Jesus because they think it's his fault. It's like, Jesus, look at this storm. How can you be sleeping? How can you not be responsible at all? You're the one who told us to go across the sea. Now look what happened. So here we see what fear does to people. Fear causes people to lose trust in Jesus. Fear causes people to lose trust in Jesus. And in this fear, some storm, we see some important observations. The disciples forgot what they experienced about Jesus. They saw Jesus perform miracles after miracles of compassion towards people. Jesus healed many people who were sick. Jesus cast many demons out of different people. He healed so many sick people. He cares deeply for people. They knew that. They saw that. But because this whole situation was so scary, they were so consumed and absorbed and focused onto this fearsome storm that they forgot how caring Jesus was. And therefore, they rebuked him for not caring when they knew through his actions that he actually cares about people more than anybody else. And in this fearsome storm, the disciples also lost sight of Jesus' words. What did Jesus say to them? He said, let's go to the other side, right? So that means Jesus had purpose for them to go to the other side. They were going to get there, right? And remember, Jesus cast demons out. He was able to heal the unhealable diseases of leprosy and other types of diseases. And he said they were going to get to the other side. And if Jesus had the power to just t tell demons to get out and they get out, whatever Jesus says, his purpose will be fulfilled for sure. But they forgot his purpose and they forgot his power because they were so overcome with this fear. And lastly, the disciples started having doubt toward Jesus. So because this whole situation was so scary, so uncomfortable, they wanted to be cleared immediately. And because Jesus didn't do as they wanted, as they expected, their fear caused them to distort their hearts to question Jesus. And fear caused them to distrust Jesus, even though they should have trusted Jesus. There was a little girl, her name was Jane. And she had a really good relationship with her mom. Jane loved her mom. She knows her mom loved her, and she likes being with her mom everywhere. So she trusts that her mom will always take care of her. And one day, Jane's mom takes her to a place that she's never been before. And Jane asks, where are we going, mom? And mom says to Jane, to the dentist, so that you can get your teeth clean. And she was so excited about going to the dentist because she's going with her mom. And so when she got to the dentist, the, ten the dentist took her into a private room, put her on this chair, put this heavy mat on her, placed tools in her mouth, made her sit there for one hour, and she experienced drilling and all these sounds in her mouth for over an, an hour, and she was so traumatized. And when she came out, Jane cried to her mom, how can you do this to me? I thought you loved me, don't you care for me? Did her mom not care about her? 
Did Jane's mom not care about her? We know that absolutely not, right? Jane's mom cared about her. That is why she brought her to the dentist so that she can have good dental health. Jane's mom waited probably two hours out there in the dentist's office just waiting for her daughter and spent all the money to pay for her daughter's procedure plus spent all that time waiting for her. So the girl's fears, Jane's fears, however, made her lose sight of the fact that her mom loves her and how good her mom has been to her. And similarly, the disciples lost sight of Jesus' character in that moment because they were so fearful. And I want to ask you, have you ever been in a situation where you thought Jesus did not care for you? Or are you in one now? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you barely earned enough money to get by and you fear for your security. And you ask God, do you not care? Or maybe you have yourself or someone you love diagnosed with an illness and you fear for your health or someone else's health. And you ask God, do you not care? Maybe you're going through a very difficult trial right now and things are so difficult and you fear what is going to happen and you cry out to God, God, do you not care for me? Or maybe you're going through a time of uncertainties where you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know where you're going to go, you don't know where you're going to live, and you fear the lack of stability in your life. And you ask, God, do you not care for me? In your fearsome situation, if you're asking God, do you not care? I pray that you will hang on to the real truths about Christ. Who cares for you? This is what the Bible says about Christ. In Romans 5, for God demonstrates his love toward you and that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. When you were a sinner, he died for you. John 10, Christ laid down his life for you so that you may be saved. And Ephesians 1 says, in love, God predestined you for adoption as his child through Christ before the foundation of this world. That means God had already planned to adopt you as his child, so he sent and gave Christ to die for you, and Christ laid down his own life for you, and he had planned this before even creating this world so that he can be your God forever and ever. So Christ has already done the greatest act of love for you, already done it, and he loves you with a love that is so wide, so high, so long, so deep that it is unthinkable, unimaginable, ununderstandable. So remember this, every time you're going through a time when you think that he doesn't care, when whatever is, going, whatever is going on in your life, it seems like he's far away, remember these truths. And the truth is, Christian, you will face scary storms in this life. You will face a lot of fearsome things, you will go through a lot of trials, but do not surrender to your fear. Because whatever seems scary to you will make you forget about Christ if you do not hang on to the truth about Christ. So remember Christ's love that he demonstrated on the cross when he took your place on the cross. And know that God works all things together for the good of those who are in him. And trust in Jesus and continue to live by faith. Now the next thing we see in our passage is that Jesus creates a great calm. So how did Jesus respond to his disciples' rebuke and this whole situation? He gives, he gives two rebukes of his own. So they, he got rebuked, and then he gives two rebukes. And the first rebukes, rebuke that he gives is in verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So first Jesus rebuked the wind and told the sea to be still. That means to be quiet. Okay? Have you ever told someone to be quiet? Have you ever told someone to be quiet? So you would know, this is a truth, okay? You would know that whoever you tell to be quiet doesn't have to be quiet, right? They can keep on being loud if they want. You have no control over whether they're gonna be quiet. Actually, a lot of times when you tell people to be quiet, they might just continue being not quiet, right? And it will be harder even to tell the wind and the sea to be quiet. You can try it, right? If you were to tell the wind and the sea to be quiet, there's probably a 0% chance that the wind and the sea will even listen to you. Okay? I'm, you can go out and try right now. Tell the wind to be quiet. It will probably keep blowing on your face. Or go out to the ocean and say, be still. It will keep on moving. The waves will keep on moving and coming. So 
We have absolutely no influence on the sea and the wind. But when Jesus told the wind and the sea to be quiet, they did it immediately. Immediately. So what's important to know here is Jesus' choice of words. Be still. He used the same words for the demons in Mark chapter 1, verse 21. When he told the demon to be quiet and come out in the man in the synagogue. If you guys remember that story in Mark chapter 1. And Satan's minion, the demon, what did he do? He had no choice but to obey the Son of God because the Son of God has all power and authority. And similarly, Jesus is using that same authority here over the spiritual darkness against the wind and the sea. And they also had no choice but to obey. And there's something deeper that we have to see here. The, the storm didn't just gradually stop, okay? There was a great calm, meaning that the sea became as smooth as marble or glass. It became very calm immediately. And have you ever ran really fast before? Or driven really fast and try to stop? Do you stop immediately? I don't think any of us can run really fast and just stop immediately. We have to slow down. Same thing as when you're driving. When you're driving, let's say you're driving on the freeway, you want to come to stop, you can't just stop. You have to slow down. Even if you press the brake as hard as you want, you keep on going. You might stop a little bit faster if you press on the brakes fast, but you still keep on going. It's gradual. The slowdown comes gradually because there's so much momentum that there has to be a powerful force to stop it completely if it to come to a complete stop immediately, right? So if you're running really fast, basically a wall would have to drop in front of you to stop you completely, immediately. So think about how much power causes a storm this big that fishermen would be scared. And think about how much power it will take to stop the force of the storm immediately. That's how much power Christ has. And I, I don't know if you guys watch a lot of like fiction and sh fictional shows, but in some fiction, you know, shows, there are characters who can control the power of nature or the storm or something like that, right? And even for those characters, even in those stories or movies or shows, when they're to stop, let's say the wind or some kind of storm, the storm stops gradually. It's never immediately. Because if it's immediate, it's just, that person is just too powerful. It's just too shocking. It's, it's just not even thinkable, right? But Jesus stopped the wind immediately. Why? How is he able to do that? Because he is the creator of the universe. He makes it stop, and it stops. He tells it to stop, it stops. He tells it to be quiet, it, everything has to obey. He is the only one that has the power to do this because he created everything, and he's able to stop all the elements of the storm immediately. And after he does this, what does Jesus do? say he gives the disciples a second rebuke his second rebuke which is he said to them why are you so afraid have you still no faith now an important truth we have to see here before we look into what this means is is this even though everything was out of control the storm was out of control the disciples fear was out of control Jesus was never out of control he was always in control. Even though he, he was sleeping and he seemed like everything was in chaos, because he's God, he's in that boat, everything was in control. And God is always in control every single day. That is why we must trust him and not fear. So now let's get back to verse 40 with Jesus' rebuke. So Jesus was saying that even though everything seemed like it would lead to death, they shouldn't have been afraid. And by using a form of a question, Jesus tells them what their main problem is in this whole situation. The problem is that disciples had no faith. Okay? So the disciples, they understood that Jesus is the Messiah by head knowledge. They knew that Jesus had the amazing power to heal uncurable diseases, that he can cast out demons. But when their lives were threatened, when they're scared for their lives, that experience and knowledge of Jesus did not help them to trust him more, to help them through the entire storm. And this all revealed that their faith in Jesus at that time was not enough. They had little faith at that very moment. Do you guys know the story of David and Goliath? 
I think all of us know the story of David and Goliath, right? So what happened in that story? There was this great warrior, Goliath, a giant warrior, that came out and taunted all of Israel. Now, Israel, they were the people of God, right? But all of Israel were greatly afraid of Goliath because he was so big. He was the biggest and strongest warrior. And the question is, how can the people of God be afraid of some, someone that's not God? They were the people who God rescued out of Egypt. God split the Red Sea for them to cross. Did they not remember that in their history? And they're fearful because they're looking at only Goliath. They're looking at how scary Goliath was, how unconquerable Goliath was, how big Goliath was. But David, one person, David, did not see the size or the power of Goliath because he kept his eyes by faith on his almighty God. Jesus, God himself was so big to David that he had no fear of Goliath because to David, God was so big that Goliath was small and did, therefore David was able to act by faith. And because David acted by faith, God rescued both David and Israel. And similarly, there's something that we need to learn is that we need to look at God. Not the big object or the fearsome thing in front of us, but look at God. There is a way to respond rightly to our fears on earth, which is you need to look at the one who is infinitely more powerful than, than your storm, whatever your storm may be. We need to look to the one who created everything and look to the one who cares for you. He is the one who cares for you. If God did not spare his one and only son, and Jesus Christ gave his own life for you, doesn't he care about you enough to give you all things? So know that he loves you. Look to the one who's so powerful and look to the one who so loves you because nothing can separate you from his love. And therefore, you need to trust him in your scary storm. You need to trust him with all your fears and you need to trust him in your helpless situation. You need to look to him. And lastly, this is the interesting part, is that Jesus causes a great fear. So how did the disciples respond to Jesus' rebuke? And verse 41, our last verse, it says, They were filled with great fear. Another great. They were greatly fearing Jesus and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So how did the disciples respond to Jesus' rebuke? His his rebuke in question. Did they respond to Jesus? Oh, Jesus, we were afraid because the storm was so big. Or Jesus, yes, we have no faith, and this is because of this and this reason. No, they couldn't even answer Jesus because they were filled with great fear. They're so fearful, they couldn't really answer Jesus. So after seeing Jesus stopping the storm completely, they no longer feared the storm. And the reason was this, is because they had a greater fear. There is something, someone that they fear even more than this storm. There's someone that's even more fearsome than this storm. That they became exceedingly, exceedingly scared. So why were they so scared? They were scared of Jesus. Why were they so scared? It's because of this. Okay? If you look at the history of the Bible, there were actually many people who were also very scared when they came into the presence of God and realized they were in the presence of God. And in the book of Ezekiel, we see that Ezekiel saw a vision of God and immediately he fell on his face in fear. And in the book of Daniel, we just gone through the book of Daniel in our Wednesday Bible studies. Daniel, when he heard God, he immediately fell on the ground, on his face, and nearly went unconscious. He was that scared. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, when he saw the risen Christ, he fell on the ground as well. So people throughout the Old Testament and even the New, when they come to experience and understand the holiness and the glory of God, they become scared. And Pastor R.C. Sproul, he gives a very good explanation of why people fear when they're confronted by God's presence. And he gives a illustration from this book called The Mysterious Stranger, written by Mark Twain. So in the book, there is this people in a small community, right? And they don't know how to respond to this unknown person who suddenly appears in their small town. He's very unknown, he's mysterious. So because he's so mysterious, 
they became very scared and frightened. And the entertainment industry, they use the same concept, right? In, in many of the movies and shows that we see, there are stories of aliens, stories of creatures, stories of mysterious beings. And the idea of all these beings is to basically make people scared. Right? We see this even during Halloween. There's all these weird creatures, all these made up creatures, mysterious creatures. And the intention of all these creatures is to make people be scared. Now similarly, anyone who encounters God are filled with great fear because people are scared of the idea of something that is unlike anything that they know. And God, He is more unlike anything that we would ever know because the Bible calls God holy, holy, holy. And that means He's completely set apart to the point where there is nothing and no one like Him. He's so set apart, meaning He's so glorious, He's so awesome, so grand, so magnificent, so pure that He's the ultimate stranger. He's completely holy. That that's the only trait of him, attribute of him, that's repeated three times. Holy, holy, little holy. He's so set apart, so set apart, so set apart, that when there's a glint of his glory, people become fearful because he's unlike anything in this world, in creation. And that's why the disciples were in great fear, because they, were, they realized they were in the presence of the supernatural. And all these natural disasters that just was happening around them, that just were happening, it didn't even matter anymore. They were in the presence of the supernatural God. Do you guys know the story of Jonah? You know the story of Jonah has some similarities uh, with this story as well. So in the story of Jonah, there was also a big storm, if you guys remember. There was a big storm that came upon the ship and there were a lot of people on the ship, there were a lot of idol god worshippers, right? And so they were sailors, and they were so scared of this storm because the storm was so great that this boat would probably either flip over or go into the sea if the storm con continues. So they pray to their gods, asking their gods to help them, but of course their gods are fake, so the gods are not going to help them. So Jonah, being on the ship, tells them that it is actually his fault that the storm is happening because he was trying to run away from Yahweh, the God of the Bible, right? And Jonah tells them, okay, throw me over the sea. If you throw me over the sea, then this storm will stop. So they listen to Jonah, and so they pick up Jonah, throw Jonah off the boat, and the storm completely stopped. And what happened when this storm stopped to the sailors? And it says in Jonah 1.16 that the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offer a sacrifice to the Lord. How amazing. These sailors, they were actually worshipping their idol gods right before this. But the moment they saw the storm stopped, they were in great fear. They realized what just happened and who did it. And they turned their hearts to worship the true God. So when the fear, when their fears were in the right place, they worship the true living God. And it shows that because they worship God and they made vows to God, right? So church, one thing we need to know is there is one person who is more fearsome than anything on earth. And that's our God, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that you need to rightly fear. And when you fear Christ, when you fear God, that fear drowns out all other fears. You don't remember, you, don't, you forget your other fears because he's so great, so grand that your focus is on him. Everything else become, becomes no longer fearsome and your fear will be in the right place and will lead you to worship God. Now, on a side note, this is a reason why Christians should not watch horror movies. Okay? This is a reason why Christians should not watch horror movies because it's a bad distraction from your fear towards God. It keeps you from focusing on the fearsome glory of God and fear something that's not even real. And a question that we might ask then, after hearing so much about fearing God and focusing our hearts towards the fear of God, how do I fear God? How do I practically fear God? Because it's something that's more easy to say than to do, right? 
How do I practically become more fearful of God and less fearful of other things? So here's the thing. We fear something when we fix our minds and our hearts towards that thing that we fear. So similarly, the way to fear God is to fix your mind and your heart towards God. So first of all, we need to read God's word. The more you read God's word, the more you think about God, the more you think about how glorious, how holy he is, the more you will come to fear him and worship him. But don't just read it. Because many times when we read it, we can easily, mindlessly read it like a robot. And we're not even soaking it in. So we need to read it and we need to think about what we're reading. Read the Bible, meditate upon it. And also we need to pray about what we read. We need to pray to God. Okay? What happens when you pray? Who are you thinking about when you're praying? You think about God. When you pray, who do you think about? You think about God. When you pray, who are you connected to in your heart and mind? You're connected to God. When you pray, who do you direct your focus to away from the world? You direct your focus to God. So the more you pray, the more you focus on God, the more your heart and your mind is aligned with God, the more you see how great He is, how powerful He is, how holy He is, and therefore the reality of God will sink into your heart more and more, and everything else will become smaller and smaller and smaller and insignificant and less fearful, but God will become more glorious and more fearsome. So church, I pray that we will read the word together, meditate on the word together, and pray upon His word together so that we will fear God and when you fear God, you will find freedom from the fear of all other things. You know, fear is a great deal in our society today. I think one of the greatest kind of what they call mental challenges is depression. But another one is fear. There are people, a lot of people who have panic attacks. And panic attacks happen because they fear something. Right? So we need to fear God. When we fear God, it will help ease all of our other fears. Because it's promised in the Bible, when we pray to God, He will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. And that peace will ease your fears. So during the early days of the church, there were Christian art that were made. And some Christian art, what it did is it portrayed the church as a boat in a very dangerous See, so the church itself is portrayed as a boat. And in the middle of that boat, which is supposed to be the church, is Jesus. And because Jesus is in the boat, the church had nothing to fear in that Christian art that was portrayed. And these Christian artwork was very important because it really encouraged the early church because they faced persecutions. They were facing hate from the people around them. They faced possible jail time, imprisonment, possibly even death sentences because they were living for Jesus and they were preaching about Christ. But when they were reminded that Christ is with them, they had nothing to fear because they knew that Christ cares and Christ is all-powerful and Christ is their shepherd leading them to the green pastures. So brothers and sisters, as God's people, First of all, know that you're not on a smooth ride to heaven. You're not on a smooth boat trip to heaven. Okay? You're actually on a really rocky boat ride down a very narrow, windy, stormy path with raging waters until you get to heaven. But through this storm that you're going through, you can know that Christ is with you. He's in the boat with you. He's in you. His spirit lives in you. He has sovereignty over all the storms and he cares for you. Therefore, you need to fear, not the storms, but fear Him and trust in your Lord Jesus Christ. And know that if you believe in Him, church, He has already stopped the greatest storm that will happen in your life. God's wrath, the greatest storm, the greatest punishment, the greatest fear, the greatest destruction has been stopped because of what He has done on the cross. He has stopped the greatest storm that will ever happen to you. Therefore, walk by faith. And in your remaining life here on earth, know that He will get you through all the storms. He's not going to stop the storms for you, but He will get you through all the storms in your life so that you can make it across to the other side. You'll get to Him in His eternal kingdom forever and ever. So trust in Him and look to Him. 